dear guests, I'm happy to welcome you to our next discussion, starting a prop trading wing, a strategic move. Prepare your notes and please help me welcome on stage our moderator of this session, Anton Sokolov, marketing manager at Brokery Solutions, who will introduce his panel. Anton, dear speakers, the stage is yours. Thanks, Elisa. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you still have energy. We, sh we surely do. Um, the session today will be, uh, we will be discussing today the opportunities the modern prop trading or trader funding operations uh, provide to brokerages specifically, uh, because some of the brokerages might be somewhat wary or cautious to enter this space. And um, we have a great panel of experts, um, some of them representing popular trading platforms brokerages use for, um, for prop trading operations. And uh, I'll let speakers introduce themselves. Hi, uh, my name is Vitaly Kudinov. I'm from DevExperts. <clears throat> DevExperts is a software vendor. We provide trading platforms, market data, watching engines for brokers, exchanges, et cetera. And also we provide solutions for prop, tra prop traders. Hello, everybody. I'm Andrew. I'm from Trade Revolution Global, which is a multi-asset trading platform company which is designed to be a back-end first solution where brokers can have a fully comprehensive, fully functional back-end suite of trading software, like a core trading engine, from where to operate their brokerage from. Our main uh, ethos is to give people brokerages more control over what they do and to give them full access to a range of multi-asset venues and liquidity providers that they can choose and to be able to hand control, more importantly, hand control back to the brokerage and away from the, uh, to the constraints of their providers. Hi, everybody. Uh, Gary Mullen, the CEO of FunderPro. We are a prop trading technology company as well as a prop firm ourselves. Uh, so we've been providing technology for prop firms for several years. And uh, I suppose a lot of experience from getting into the industry around three years ago, seeing the evolution as it has happened in the last couple of years. We provide a full suite of technology from customer support through to account management, uh, liquidity, and the trading platform itself. Hi, uh, I'm Elena. I'm uh, the Chief Marketing Officer of uh, Spotware. Uh, we are the creators of C-Trader. Anybody here know C-Trader? Somebody said choo choo, which means a little bit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so we are uh, a, a trading platform, uh, open source. Uh, we are premium trading platform. Um, we are uh, heavily focused on um, algo trading solutions at the moment, and you know we're basically you know your full service trading platform. Um, and uh, we just la uh, recently launched our new brand new offers for startups to open a brokerage or a prop firm. So I'm very happy to be here discussing this hot topic indeed. Hi, my name. It's working. Yeah, it's working. Hi, my name is Alexis Drushodis, and I am the head of Match Trader Platform. We've been operating for over 10 years. We have over 250 clients, both brokers and prop firms. We offer a trading platform, CRM, and our new addition is an A to Z solution for prop firms. That was concise. <laughs> um, so let's begin. Um, as, as I said in the, in the intro, um, the prop space is booming right now. We see lots of companies entering the market. We see lots of companies exiting the market for a variety of reasons. Uh, we are still yet to find or to see a clear uh, regulatory approach to the new ideas. Uh, although the ideas are very nice and good and we'll explore how they are applicable to the brokerage business. And uh, maybe let's start with the simpler question. Uh, so why should a broker consider opening a prop wing? And let's start with Gary and Alexis. Sure. Uh, so I think, as most people would know, FTMO would have been the, the leader within the industry and starting it 
you know, approximately 10 years ago. Um, the space has evolved a lot since then. I think brokers have stayed out of it, I guess, through regulatory concerns and, and other concerns to this point. But um, with the volatility that's been seen over the last six months, I think gives a distinct opportunity for brokers now to actually capitalize on that and use their own, um, I suppose, trust factor in saying, you know, we're here, we are a regulated company, and the fact that they have already a level of trust can give them a really good head start in the prop space. Um, having a prop arm in your broker is, uh, I suppose, valuable on multiple reasons. One of the main ones is uh, acquisition of clients and the cost of acquisition. So many brokers will be used to paying CPAs of 600, 1,000 uh, plus, where the acquisition of a prop uh, firm is more like 50 to $80. And so the cost of acquisition is way, way lower. Also having then a broker and a prop firm together gives you a much longer lifetime value. So you can transition the client from trading on their own account and then I suppose if they're going through the life cycle of their account, they're looking for something different, having that transition into a prop challenge gives them uh, and the business uh, a much longer lifetime value. Yeah, building on what Gary just said, um, also we can, uh, I the cost of acquisition for prop trading um, wing can be zero because you can address already churned users. We know that the lifetime value of traders can be you know, uh, can, can be better sometimes. Um, so the churned users can be approached with this new offering and you acquire a new, uh, a new level and a new income at zero costs. So my perspective is why brokers? One is because they have the understanding, they understand the market, they have the knowledge, they understand the risks. So they're the perfect candidates. Now in regards to technology, they have a trading platform, they have a CRM, they have the PSPs, you're integrated with your LPs, so you touch also the technology aspect. You have the people in place. Now, okay, no regulation, but you have your compliance, your legal department, when regulation does come into place, you know how to play your cards. You have your sales, your marketing department, so your whole operation is a duplicate of what you would need. Now, what you mentioned before, FX is also saturated, and the cost to acquired traders very high. And now there's hundreds of thousands of prop traders out there. Now if a, a broker doesn't take the move, then someone else will do. And you know, they, they miss that segment of the market which they could have acquired. Perfectly said. Um, when I was researching the topic, or when we are speaking with clients regarding the prop trading space, or trader funding space, or trader discounting space, we're still <laughs> yet to agree on, 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 on a single term for, for the whole thing. Uh, we might see some confusion around the space or confusion around certain subjects, although the basics of it are understandable by everybody. So my next question would be, what are the key misunderstandings um, about trader funding or trader scouting uh, programs that you come across when you're speaking with your clients, with uh, you know, upcoming brokers? And uh, would you like to start with this? One? Yeah, I can take it. Um, so first of all, uh, I think that brokers sometimes, or prop firms sometimes, underestimate the uh, importance of the demo account for a, for a contest, uh, how good it is in terms of order execution, market data, usability, etc. Because some, some of them still call it demo account, but in fact, it's not a demo account, it's a new type of account. It's not demo, it's not real money, it's a prop account, right? But it needs to use real, real time data, right? It needs to have as good execution as possible, meaning that it must be uh, volume weighted average price execution, not the best bid offer price execution. Uh, and it needs to uh, like reflect the reality of the market, like that you cannot execute your order always at the best price. There is a slippage, and the market may move very fast from your uh, like preferred price. So if the platform supports that mode, most likely it must be a different type of account. So that, that would be like first misunderstanding. And the second is 
some brokers do not actually understand why people love prop trading. Actually, it's in the very core psychology, I think, of, of, of a human. And uh, remember, a few years ago, there was no IFX Expo without at least one panel saying, uh, having gamification in its title. Remember, gamification. So props is the last piece of the puzzle, finally, like, moving this trading into, into gamification, because this is what people like. They want to reset their account. They want to start from the beginning. Okay, they lost last time, and then they can restart, and they don't need to pay their own money. Uh, well, they pay subscription fee, but not, like, a few thousand of dollars to, to deposit to their account. So I think that that's perfect, that perfect match of what people love to do and what brokers can offer. Go ahead, Gary. Yeah, uh, I would even say there's a little bit of nuance in that also in that the understanding of why somebody is taking a prop challenge um, can be a little bit skewed. Uh, a lot of people think that it's, I'm going to take a risk to see if I can actually just get access to large capital, which there are a lot of people who do that, and there are people who buy 20 challenges, pass four of them, and eventually get paid on one of them. There are definitely people that do that, but there's also just a huge cohort of people in countries where they just don't have access to meaningful capital, and trying to trade an account that has 50 to $100, and then to make a living off of that, when you know your salary and in the whole month might be 150 to 200 dollars it's just not you know this is their way to actually get access to meaningful capital so they can use trading as a long term strategy of you know providing for themselves and for their family um what i'd say the second misconception is is risk management so a lot of people have very sophisticated risk tools and risk teams in their brokers but understanding the way that a prop trader trades, uh, the strategies that everybody uses to manage their B-book and manage their solutions on a broker is completely different. Um, just for example, the main point is you don't have skin in the game as a trader. And so your loss of that account is just a loss of your time. So you may go and take another challenge again, but that's all you've physically lost. And so without that skin in the game, people are able to take larger risks without feeling it personally on their own account. Uh, and so anybody, any broker that's looking at this and feeling that they can run the same models that they have currently on their broker and they'll be effectively able to manage the risk on a prop firm, uh, it won't operate the same way. Um, and so from our perspective, uh, that's one of the biggest misconceptions that we see. Andrew, you wanted to add something? Yeah, actually, I would add to that. I think there's a, what we could do here is take a little bit of a step back to the technological framework because it's, it certainly is a very big trend at the moment, prop trading, which has really taken everything by storm. You can see lots of um, large companies even going down this route and even former senior executives of very big companies now starting prop trading firms which are independent. So that's a current, that's how big the trend is. But let's have a quick look f back a bit at how that can, that is just one trend that's now. There have been things like this in the past, such as simplified mobile apps, fractional, uh, fractional shares and things like that, which have been, companies have rallied to issue those products and to get them to market in a way that, meets the time scale that those trends are relevant. So that applies to some extent to brokers wanting to look at potentially starting a prop trading uh, wink division of their company at this particular point in time. Because to be able to do so needs to be done from a standpoint of being able to scale and build your technology system in a way that suits not just this trend, but future ones as well so that you are able to select a, 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 platform, a basis for your platform infrastructure and a basis for all your trading infrastructure that will allow your brokerage to diversify its product range in specific directions that you as a brokerage want to, to, to move into rather than what is available to you on an existing platform, on an existing uh, system that is in place. Or the, 
th then there's a, in fact, you're faced with an issue there where you can either potentially not participate in it or go to the extent of building a separate platform and a separate um, technology stack, either have it built or build it yourself, which is resource hungry and is, is, it results in a fragmentation of, of, of systems and therefore inability to cross-sell uh, product range. So, for example, if you, if you have a system which allows you to, to, to scale in, in, in towards prop trading and go down the prop trading route, you can perhaps uh, bring the dormant clients into prop trading that are already on your database. And therefore, it reduces marketing costs and so forth. It also keeps the brokerage in a very unified condition. So that is just one example of where, and then of course when you start a prop trading, um, if you do start a prop trading wing, at this particular moment we're seeing the very dawn of prop trading. It's not a, it's not, um, it's, it's maturity, it's in its, re it's in its infancy and, and everybody is now talking about it, it's the latest thing, it still has a long way to go. Who knows which direction, because it's a new thing, who knows which direction it might go in with the nature of the innovation within our industry. Who knows? So there needs to be a focus on having a, a, an infrastructure, a software, a software suite, which allows the brokerage to continue to evolve that. So if they do go down the prop trading route, they are, should be able to do so themselves without any constraint from their provider, using the systems they've got and the, and the infrastructure they've got to build the prop trading uh, division, and then to be able to adapt and evolve it as that particular in division of the industry matures. And that should apply to anything. It could be, for example, let's say uh, in a year's time, another big phenomenon like this happens, should be able to keep your prop trading wing that you've started, keep your core business, and also be able to participate in the next uh, big wave of, of, of development if, if your brokerage wants to do so. And therefore, choosing a software solution which allows that to be, which is, part, which is very, um, very much empowers the broker and doesn't, it doesn't have any constraints levied upon the brokerage by the provider, should be really paramount to the consideration before looking at going, diversifying a product range or, or, or looking at different types of client bases to go into. And therefore, it needs to be a um, a back-end first platform that is, um, that is able to be administered by a brokerage and, and customized accordingly with no constraints from the outside, no, no uh, let's call it a glass ceiling imposed by a, by a platform provider. I think that is a really fundamental consideration before looking at the, where to diversify. The, the one thing I'd add to this, and I think even from a, a match trade perspective as well, you'd probably agree is, while that is relevant, I think also there is a point to say, because it is in its infancy, the innovation that's happening is so fast and so significant that I think a regulated broker, if they were to see this as an additional project, would never keep the speed that a platform that's continuously innovating and has multiple clients feeding into it would be able to adapt to the changes. And so the innovation will outspeed having that, you know, that independence and that ability to adapt. And I'd say you're also seeing that in your platform. Yeah, 100%. Well, thanks for bringing this up. Actually, the importance of training platform uh, in this operation, we've seen lots of, we've seen high volatility of how training platforms are, like new ones emerge and the selection of those for the prop training operations. Uh, so I, I, I'm actually, since we have pretty much all training platform providers presented on the panel, let's actually dive into what are the key points you, as a trading platform provider, look, uh, are looking for or like pay attention to when working with brokerages or uh, said prop firms. Because we've seen some of the pl platform providers removing the licenses of, of said prop firms. So how could brokers you know, secure themselves or make themselves in a better spot to prevent or to avoid such conflicts? Alex, would you like to? Yeah, sure. I'll touch a bit more on the operational side. Now, what we look for is that, you know, when we partner with a firm, that first they have experience and they understand the market and they understand the risks. 
Now, the reason for this is because we want longevity with our clients. We don't want someone to come and after three months after training him, you know, he's just gone. Another thing is, in regards to operations, is do they have the teams to, su to support their teams? Do they have a tech team? Do they have support departments? And also marketing teams. Because if they can't actually grow, I touch upon the point of long longevity again. So I'll leave the legal side apart in the regulation because we don't have a clear guideline yet. We've seen regulation touch upon it, but I don't want to move into it. What we look for is longevity with the client, and we look that they have the knowledge and understandings, and they know the risk it takes. Because then we can see the risk factor on a specific client. Tali, I believe you had some, something to say about the, the trading platforms or what trade funding firms should avoid when working with them to ensure long longevity, yes? Uh, well, I would say uh, for CFD business, there are less uh, things to like to focus on because yeah, it's OTC trading anyway. But uh, don't forget, there are prop trading firms offering futures trading or stock trading, right? And we have the platform that serves that as well. And there, you consume the real-time market data coming from an exchange, and you need to license that data. So if you don't, first you like you breach the the license of the data originator, and second, uh, brokers that pay for that data, they will like, fight you because like, you, you, you steal their clients because you don't pay for the data, and uh, they need to pay for the data, right? So that's one thing, but it doesn't really, again, it doesn't relate to OTC trading. Now, talking about the trading platform and its readiness for this business, um, I would say uh, it was surprised, but I think it's in the origin of the prop trading. The load on a platform is more stable than with the brokerage accounts because you, you approximately have the same, same average load on the platform because people are forced to trade with a certain frequency, right? And the amount of like, accounts participating in the contest is all, also expected. So you just need to stress test and prepare your platform for a specific amount of user accounts and then you're good. So stress test, and don't forget that there is a regulation. Yes. Uh, I'm actually curious uh, about Gary's perspective here, since you are the only one here working with multiple trading platforms. Yeah, correct. So uh, I think even from the perspective of, of let's say, our direct-to-consumer side, so effectively I am a consumer of other trading platforms, um, uh, I think, you know, from our perspective, the client, I suppose, is paramount. And so understanding, you know, why does a trader choose a certain trading platform is the first element. So, you know, a lot of them are choosing the platform because of the person that they're getting educated from, the, the source of, you know, the source of that education and what platform they're using. I think that's the biggest predictor in the platform choice that the customer is going to make going forward. And so for a prop trading firm or for a broker that's looking to offer this, having a range of uh, prop platforms is always beneficial to give them more choice. And so you're not turning somebody away because they're used to using CTrader and you're only offering another platform, for instance. Um, then I think the second point is a lot of if we're thinking traditionally within the industry, even if you think of the infrastructure that you would have employed for your demo uh, servers versus your live servers, you know, considering the technology that you would have spent on your live servers would have just been you know, much, much more than your demo servers. And taking that into account now with the larger demand on your demo servers, and you need to be certain that the execution that happens on these accounts is the, is the real live market simulated um, conditions, you need to make sure that the performance of these servers is going to be as good as your live, because effectively, this is practically your live server for this new type of account. Makes perfect sense. Um, so the demo accounts are an actual live account in this case, right? Yeah, which I, I think goes to your point where it's, you know, these are simulated live accounts. They're not demo. They are just simulated live Don't accounts. Don't call them demo. Effectively, yeah. Uh, even on, on our systems, we call them real accounts. Okay. 
Um, so since we already touched upon uh, a few aspects of clients, clients part, uh, let's actually dive more into the differences. So there is data to suggest that uh, the traders who are signing up for challenges might have either different mindset, different trading strategies, or generally just a different kind of audience. So they do not, like prop firms do not necessarily fight with brokerages for the same audience. They're actually expanding the audience of it. So I'd like to start with Elena. Uh, what are the differences of like, in tra trading habits and mindset of the traders participating in challenges versus the brokerage? Uh, well, we can, um, s we can split the, the differences into several categories. I, I would start with the psychological differences. I'd say that uh, the uh, traders that choose prop trading at the moment are more risk averse than the ones that choose, um, you know, the let's say classic, you know, trading, uh, just because when you enter trading, you are, um, you know, you are free to, to, to start with, you know, any amount or choosing every, uh, any leverage and you are, um, you know, you're learning uh, every step of the way and you have to actively search for answers and make a lot of mistakes. So this is why mostly, um, you know, the prop traders, they, choose less, uh, they open less positions when trading and they're more focused on the quality of the positions that they're opening uh, rather than the, um, you know, classic traders where they have, um, you know, they open a lot of positions uh, just to test their strategies. Um, and, uh, you know, the prop, uh, prop traders, they're less, uh, let's say, susceptible to uh, push and make their own choices rather than, you know, uh, regular traders because they, they decide to uh, be led in a certain way to, be, to work within a f very, very strict framework, which is a very good way to, uh, in my opinion, to learn trading, to understand the ways uh, of the traders are and plus um, the new generation of traders is coming into, uh, you know, to, to be more susceptible to these challenges rather than to uh, explore the world, of tr the world of trading by themselves and go and push for, you know, education. Uh, plus, um, the, uh, the, the education uh, that, that, that is required uh, to become a successful, let's say, trader uh, normally is, uh, is way longer and we are less... Um, you know, we, we, will, we, we want to spend less time to consume content uh, and to, to focus on content. This is why we, we prefer to watch reels on, on, on Instagram or TikTok rather than, you know, read a book in, at night. Uh, and uh, I believe that prop trading is a version of, of this uh, new mindset in, in terms of uh, trading industry. I totally agree with you, Elena. The correlation of the habit is on the psychology of trading on your own money or trading on behalf of someone else's money. Now, I do both. So I trade and I prop because you know, it's good to get the experience. Now, on my trading account, I don't want to take the risk. I don't want to take short-term strategies. I prefer to stay a bit safe and take long-term strategies. Now, on my prop account, it's only $100, $200, so I don't mind them taking the risk because it's just $100. I'm not losing my whole capital if I was on, a, on my normal account, so I will take a short-term strategy so I can pass my goals. And let's not forget that in, in challenges, you also have a time frame. So if your time frame is reaching its limit of the challenge, then I need to take some more risk to pass. So my idea is the habit is correlated to trading with my own money or trading with someone else's money. So that's my two cents. Go yeah. Ahead. Oh. Go ahead first. I would, yeah, I would add two things more. So actually, I would, I would divide the, the, the audience, of like users of prop trading firms into two uh, two parts. So one part 
is just people who, 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 who like to trade, like who, who, who see it as a game. They like to trade not their own money, but just someone else's money, and they're ready to pay for that. I know the company that provides demo accounts for a fee, and there is no contest. People are not trading for, to, to get a price. They're just playing with it, right? But the second category is, like you said, traders. There are both like real money traders and uh, co contest participants because they believe they're good traders and they can win. But again, I agree with Elena here saying that uh, the prop trading framework disciplines the traders. They understand that there is a short time frame and they cannot lose the opportunity to enter the trade and they need to control when they exit the trade. So, um, yeah, at some extent, it, it, again, I will repeat myself, but it was the missing part of the brokerage business that now exists. And brokers should really consider offering it, it alongside with real money accounts. What kind of trend did you observe? Yeah, so uh, I think to, to both of your points around the, the time frame element and, and the, that challenge part, I think this, is, this has been the, you know, the challenge itself shapes the behavior of the trader. And I think, you know, when we started to get involved direct to consumer around a year and a half ago, we started to see a race to the bottom in terms of challenges getting easier, cheaper, faster. And, and that criteria then shaped the prop trader in a way that they, they did take more challenges and they were effectively arbitraging their way into getting a funded account. And the metric then became, I just need to spend, I need to earn more money than I spend on challenges and I'm positive. Um, and so the criteria in and of itself, and I suppose this is one of the key differentiators that we made, um, if you take back a step and say, what is prop trading? What should it be? Would you take $100,000 out of your bank, get a mortgage, <laughs> take 100000 out of your bank and give it to somebody who placed five trades and passed a challenge? Of, of course you wouldn't. Uh, but effectively, that's what's happening uh, in this scenario. And so, you know, if the firm was to then create you know, back to what proprietary trading really was, where you actually were trying to challenge the person, putting in reasonably hard criteria so that you make sure that you get proper evaluations and traders then that are somewhat more consistent. That way then, you're actually trying to shape the trader into being a better trader and somebody who deserves to have $100,000 in capital. Um, and so I think, you know, it is a lot on the prop firm or the broker to set reasonable criteria to shape the experiences of a trader in the way that you know is actually going to serve the firm and the trader and not just be a short term capital grab basically uh, and trying to squeeze out because i think back to your point andrew that then leads to this being a fad rather than a long term sustainable offering yeah absolutely i don't and i don't think it should be a fad it should mm. be sustainable and developable if that's a word, <laughs> it should be something you can actually, that brokerage, if you're going to make the effort to do it, like you have, you know, your company has been established in a way that you've done it for the long term and it's a, you know, you're encompassing lots of aspects of it. If you're going to be a brokerage that is now currently doing other asset classes in a normal retail brokerage fashion, then it needs to be done in a way that is sustainable, that you don't just see it as, a, as, oh, I need to ride this trend. Let's quickly get a quick fix to it. Quickly get, get, where can I get that from? Oh, here we go. I'll just do it and then I'll start marketing. And then, of course, you end up running into a, a brick wall because it's not, it's not a, 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 a use, useful enough solution to that thing. It needs to be done in a way that it isn't seen as a fad and can be continually developed as it goes down and matures. I mean, look now at our, at the, at the kind of, um, retail forex trading industry now, 20 years after a lot of new brands came in, 
is very different to how it was 20 years ago. And some of those initial pioneering companies, they don't exist anymore. Some of them are massive and have actually bought their, have, have built their own trading platforms or bought the source code from their provider as times have gone. It's not just the old traditional uh, companies like Saxo Bank and CMC Markets that we know for 30, more than 30 years have had their own infrastructure and spent a, a lot at the outset building that. So they could then scale however they want. And if they want to, they can go and do prop trading and do whatever they like because they own their, they built their own system and have all their development staff and support staff there. But of course, uh, more recently, some other companies that aren't that didn't do that from the outset have been developing their own infrastructure. More recently, the most recent example I can think of is Pepperstone, who in Australia launched their own trading platform. You know, uh, but some of them have bought their own, bought the source code, and then now they've de since then developed. So these companies are more looking towards the longer term, and they're looking to build something which they can decide how they want to operate it. And if they do do something like prop trading, they can continue to evolve it, and maybe in 20 years' time we'll be seeing that that has evolved as well as the retail trading industry itself. But you, the key factor is, like you say quite rightly, Gary, you need to be in a position where your brokerage has the tools from the outset to be able to continue to build forward and not see it as a fad, jump into something which is outside your existing trading infrastructure and then become constrained by it. And you either have to give it up or you have to reinvent it all over again, start building your own, and then transfer all the customers on. It becomes very unsustainable like that. When you, when you said about how, what is going to look like in 20 years, what I think important to remember is that um, all the breakthrough, breakthroughs, they are built on the, you know, on the border of different industries. Right. So um, what uh, Anton said in the beginning, that is the gamification of, of, uh, of trading. And um, I think we, what we will see in 20 years, in pro it's not going to be even prop trading. It's going to be a completely new way right. of, of trading where, you know, there was going to be, I mean, in, in my mind, it's, it's uh, the automation of trading that is going to be the foundation of how the new... Uh, trading landscape will look like from you know from the from the human you know fingers to the automation of everything in in in, uh, in the code that we see and any trading platform uh, should be aware of that I think yeah and and I think specifically again from the consumer perspective and, and then how the businesses are, are forming around that the way that I see it now, and, and again, I guess in the beginning of the Forex industry before regulation started to, to shape that, you know, there was the concept from the banks, then it got brought retail and uh, I suppose a lot of uh, interesting and, and possibly not very good things started to happen and then regulation came in to form it and shape it back into something that was beneficial for the company but also sustainable and positive for the trader themselves and i think within the prop trading industry uh, you know what we're hoping and, and what we're trying to build our business on is that transition back to something like obviously we're talking about this now as a new thing but in fact it's incredibly old you know there are proprietary trading firms that have been doing this 50 years ago and i think that evolution will see its way back to actually the business not being formed around challenge fees, but the business actually being formed around trying to find traders who can trade on your behalf and earn revenue through their trading. So you think basically it will end up, the, what we're seeing now, retail brokerage diversifying into, will it could eventually become actual proprietary trading firms hiring traders to trade their own funds in-house? I, I believe so. I, I, and I think that's, that's a differentiator that's, that's going to have to come over time. I know there are a lot of extremely good traders who have just never considered taking a prop challenge because they don't, it, the offer is too good to be true <laughs> in a certain sense. And I think that's the evolution that needs to come through in that those types of traders then understand the value of a proprietary trading firm. And I think having a regulated broker 
that has a strong level of trust behind them now brings validity to the industry and then those types of traders who are actually long-term consistent good traders then will see the benefit and then naturally then those traders will be making money if you are operating this as an A-Book solution, then you go from having it as a cost of business to actually a revenue driver. So in, that, in a circumstance like that, if that, if that does come to pass, which I agree with you, it's very possible that that may happen, it's quite likely that brokerages should consider how to, how to have an infrastructure, a trading platform infrastructure that suits that type of commercial use. It's a commercial, it becomes, instead of becoming a, as well as, being a retail client base, this is a commercial use. You're having uh, companies where they've got professional traders working for them. And you have, therefore, diversification into different asset classes and potentially if they've become a professional trader and they are employed to trade the, the, the funds of the, of the prop trading firm, they will need to have access to um, certain liquidity, any liquidity pool or, or, or certify uh, platforms against directly against uh, exchanges because if a prop trading firm gets very, very big and they start doing US equities and futures, then they might not necessarily see the, see the uh, importance of going through a middleware. They might want to become an exchange clearing member and therefore certain ha an exchange, a platform should be certifiable against an exchange directly and therefore those prop traders are directly trading US equities on New York Stock Exchange directly from that exchange from that platform. So this is the, an example of the agility that's needed to be able to cater for the potential way this quite large um, rush towards prop trading might develop uh, in the future. And of course, uh, to be able to do that and have that level of functionality and, uh, and at your, uh, uh, being done at the request of a brokerage, brokerage being able to go down the route of certifying their platform based exchange and having that those exchange listed futures directly accessible on the similar on the same platform the same account as OTC FX and other things is a is an example of the wide level of functionality that might be needed and the cost saving uh, aspect of having one platform with one account and one back end that a, a commercial trading firm might need so i think to this applies to how what we were talking about earlier that the that to, what, what do you need to consider to become, to, if you're looking at, becoming, at going down the prop trading route? The answer is every possible angle that might come from there. And therefore, the trading platform back end has to be able to, to add any sort of asset class, certify against any exchange, and be able to offer prop trading facilities to any type of customer with any front end, because a prop trading firm might even develop their own front end trading interface at some point. So it all needs to be fully customizable in that way, so that the company can keep building itself forward without having to reinvent itself and, uh, and start all over again at some point. Uh, I, I would actually like to throw a curveball to the discussion, and uh, we will have to close the session with this question, but um, let's, let's try to think of other applications of said technology, right? Because a brokerage is a brokerage, and they don't necessarily want to actually fund their traders, right? In a sense that they are still want to be, let's say, uh, like a middleman or like an an avenue for, for the markets, but they don't necessarily want to operate a hedge fund, right? That's a completely different business. So how do you think brokers can increase their lifetime value with introduction of prop trading services? We can start with Elena, maybe. Ouch. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, well, this is uh, this is something that um, you know I, I've mentioned uh, in the beginning that uh, you can diversify between uh, different types of traders, and also you can teach your traders to diversify between different types of investments and trades. And this is the key to increasing your lifetime value uh, by uh, you know introducing a new approach to trading. Uh, and educating another group of people that might have been disappointed in, you know, in the whole trading industry because they, they, uh, they're not willing to risk anymore because of a heavy loss and it's psychologically very, uh, very hard to, to start again uh, when you're you know, not on the high professional level. Yeah, I, would, uh, I think that at some point prop trading firms should uh, issue certificates for winners 
like for, for, for people who constantly win uh, contests. Because these people, they are superstars, like they, 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 they have the knowledge, they have the, the self-discipline, so why don't someone give their money for these people to trade, still on the same platform? So I think this is where this, this industry can evolve. So uh, people can get certificates and say, if I'm trading with an established prop trading firm that exists like five or 10 years in the market, uh, people will, will, will actually trust the certificate. They will believe that it's not just printed because they share the, <laughs> the profit. No, it's true. So they would give their money to those uh, best performance. So if you, basically what you're saying, Vitaly, is you, you want to create a sort of institution for to, to recognize the talents and abilities of specific traders. And they, these certificates would be a, uh, like, rather like an ex examination certificate pass where you are recognized by an institution for that. So I think that's a good idea. And I think to be able to do, if, if, if companies do that, then they should have a, they should factor into this the potential um, of having customer loyalty to them, to that particular firm. So whether that might be custom, making a custom uh, user interface so that the traders learn on that trading interface, get used to that trading interface, and stay trading with that particular... So you, you know, you're building your own brand as a prop firm. So you're having your own uh, front-end interface. You might want to have your own custom one that you build yourself and integrate it into a back-end that can power it. And that way, those customers, those traders, become very sticky, and they don't, go, they don't suddenly disappear off to another company, and they will continue to trade on that platform because it's, if they're succeeding and getting such a certificate and doing well and building their status as a trader, as a professional trader, then they're not going to go and learn another platform or work on a generic platform where they can just be contacted. If, if you, if, think about a marketing department in this industry. If they see somebody collecting those certificates, they might want the prestige of that trader trading on their platform. If all the platform front ends are all the same, then a marketing person is going to call them and say, come over to us, we'll give you lots of incentives and reasons to do so, and they can easily switch because it's a generic platform interface. If it's a specific to that company, and that company has grown the trader, and the trader is, is now a, a, of a high status, he's going to stay there. And that is a really important consideration when you're looking at how to keep Lifetime value, and yeah. the lifetime value of traders, right? I'd like to circle back again. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> let, let, let's be quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I will circle back quickly. Um, so um, what Gary said is that um, a lot of uh, professional traders will not even consider uh, trying a prop trading challenge. And I think the problem is in how prop trading is marketed right now. It's, uh, you know, a magician archetype sort of thing, like press one button and become super rich uh, in one moment. And and this is, uh, I think, is going against the industry because what this industry uh, solidifies is that we are not binary options. We're not a casino. We are a serious trading industry. And prop is not the border or an or, or version of this, you know, uh, of this type of, uh, you know, of, of, of challenges um, that that are not serious enough. For for professional traders to take part in, and this is this is the key thing to uh, you know to communicate I think to your clients that it's actually a serious way to test your abilities as a trader. Yeah. Perfectly said. You want to add something up? Yeah, if I can quick. jump in for the final bit. Uh, yeah, look, I think uh, effectively we're we're talking about monetizing here, uh, and your point was okay, maybe the brokerage might not want to be funding these, you know traders with large, large capital and becoming a hedge fund. But I think monetization in terms of your certificate idea, I see, you know, of course, copy trading. You look at companies like eToro um, and, you know, that, that element of proving your track record, getting access to a certain level of capital, but then also getting other traders and the ability to trade is one area. Looking at, you know, challenges for beginner traders, challenges for professional traders, there are so many ways that prop trading challenges can be used to help a brokerage monetize without it being the actual funding element. Uh, and I think over the next three, four, five years, we're going to just see much more additions to the suites uh, and having that, having that as an element of monetization that just expands further and further and just increases the lifetime value of a user or attracting people who have never been in the industry before. Does that something uh, short 
as you said, there's different types of challenges and you can adapt them and create them the way you want. And the thing I've seen now with brokers is, is because they have the educational material in place, what they're doing is to increase the lifetime value also of the clients, they're creating educational challenges where they're trading them. Because what happens is, is if a new trader doesn't understand or he's not educated correctly, he will lose and never come back again. So they're using prop to educate them with the educational material a broker would already have to increase the lifetime value and just, you know, give them what they need. But, yeah, and the final point on that, I think the, the two points go together. You need to genuinely connect the reason why they're taking part in that. So don't tell a beginner trader that it's easy to get access to $200,000 in capital and you should do it. A beginner trader should not try that challenge. 100%. So it needs to be fit for the purpose that it is going to be. And then the monetization will come. Perfectly said. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.